Hello, how is everyone? If you have clicked on this video, I will assume that you have watched part 1 of this mini-series, but in case you haven't, let me just briefly explain what I'm going to talk about today. I create videos about the history of Japan and I already covered the Paleolithic era and the Jomon era, or Age of Pottery. Because of this, I decided to challenge myself to find all manga whose plot takes place in prehistory and talk a bit about my first impression of them. I divided the manga I found into several categories, those that take place in an alternative or post-apocalyptic world that mimics prehistory, those that take place in prehistory but on other places around the world other than Japan, and those that take place in Japan, being that this can be either educational or written purely to entertain, without care for historical accuracy. In the last video, I presented five manga whose aim is to educate school children about the history of Japan and today I'm going to talk about five more. All of these deal with the Paleolithic and the Jomon eras. The first manga we are going to talk about today is called Gakushu Manga Shonen Shoujo Nihon no Hekichi or Educational Manga for Boys and Girls History of Japan by the mangaka Aomura Jun who was born in Yamaguchi Prefecture in 1941. Like all manga of this type, this one begins in, with an introductory page explaining how people lived in the distant past, followed by a page showing the characters who will take part in this story. In chronological order, the stories are Mammut Ant, Blessings of the Sea and Mountains, An Equal Battle, and Queenie Miku. But logically, the preview pages only give us access to the first chapter. The characters featured in the first story are a boy called Muzazabi, which apparently means flying squirrel in Japanese, his father, an elderly leader of a Paleolithic group, and a mammut. It's the first time an animal has appeared as a character, and what immediately comes to mind is that perhaps this mammut will be found by Muzazabi and adopted, thus growing up within the community. We will see if I'm right. The plot begins at a camp in Hokkaido. Two rabbits, yes, rabbits, I had to look twice too, observe the human bustle and comment that they have never seen so many tents together in one place. With the rapid decline of the megafauna, populations are more likely to gather in the same places and form clusters. Musazabi is hunting birds with the other children and his father when a group of men come to announce that they have spotted a herd to the north. Musazabi asks his father if he can go too, but his father explains that hunting birds is very different from hunting mammoths. The group finds the herd of mammoths baiting in a river. As with modern elephant herds, the mammoth herds were made up of females and their young. One of the mammoths notices that there are men hiding both upstream and downstream, and alerts the others. The animals rush out of the river to start a stampede, but one is left behind by a trapped leg and is killed by the hunters. Shortly afterwards, the men hear a noise in the bushes and discover a mammoth calf, which they capture and take back to the camp. I couldn't work out what they were going to use it for, I don't think it was ever explained. The woman brings the tents closer to the river and set them up again, and the whole group processes the mammoth's meat, cooking it on hot stones. After the feast, when everyone is asleep, Muzazabi quietly sneaks out of one of the tents and looks for the baby mammoth to set it free. He cuts the rope that binds the cub and tells it to run away and look for its mother. The manga sample ends at this point in the story. What do I think? Despite the initial shock of realizing that in this story, the animals are anthropomorphic in the sense that they have a human consciousness, this is in fact what sets the story apart from the others we saw in the other video. The addition of the mammoth cub is the selling point of this manga. I kind of want to know what happens to it. Given that this is a children's manga, I think it is safe to assume that the uh, mammoth either goes back to its mother or becomes Muzazabi's companion. I don't think they would kill the baby mammoth in a manga like this. This next manga is part of a series of educational manga released by Kadokawa Corporation, which is well known internationally and worldwide. Probably due to this fact, this set of volumes on Japanese history is particularly famous, compared to the others I showed in this and the previous video, I mean. 
and of course not eat in the West for obvious reasons. The story begins by telling us how 30,000 years ago, humanity already existed and struggled to survive during the, uh, during the last Ice Age, despite the harsh conditions. Unlike the characters in the other manga we have seen so far, the characters in this story are not yet in Japan, but on the continent of Eurasia. The plot begins somewhere around 20,000 years ago. The characters in this very short introductory chapter don't have names, so I've taken the liberty of naming them. I will call the boy Kuro, the woman who always appears next to him, probably his mother I will call Pony, and her husband I will call Kuma. Kuro and Pony are coming out of a cave when they see hunters arriving with the prey they have managed to catch. Immediately, Pony starts cutting the meat, while explaining to Kuro that the rock pierces so well because it is obsidian. The various types of stone tools and the process of making a tool are introduced to the reader in an aside. A few days later, Kuma announces an important discovery. He believes that herds of mammoth are migrating south and thinks that the group should follow them. An old man is vehemently opposed to the idea, unwilling to leave the territory where he has lived all his life. The group splits into those who want to stay and those who want to set off to discover. Kuro joins the group that decides to leave. During the journey, Kume explains to Kuro that you can't just let the course of events take you, that you have to use your head and make decisions, but Kuro is too young to understand what Kume is saying. It is implied that this group of characters was one of many who eventually reached the archipelago of Japan, which at the time was accessible thanks to lower sea levels. It is thought that this is how the archipelago came to be inhabited, thanks to Paleolithic groups that followed the immigration flow of large animals. Then a time lapse occurs. We are now in the Jomon period, 2,500 years ago, and history takes its course. A ceremony is taking place in a stone circle, led by a shaman. The recipient of the ceremony is a pregnant woman. The shaman breaks a dogu, which is a clay figure. It is believed that in these days, the dogu were broken as a way of preventing evil from befalling a person. By breaking this dogu, the shaman is ensuring the child will be born safely. When the baby boy is born, he is given the name Ajime, which means the beginning. The elderly shaman draws a symbol on the baby's forehead to give him protection. The women of the village come to bring gifts to the new mother. It is then explained that although jade was particularly popular in the Yayoi and Kofun periods, the stone was already used and traded before that, even in the Jomon period, and that it was carved into many different shapes. Another offering consisted of a basket of walnuts, which are easier to eat than Japanese or chestnuts, which have toxic substances, namely saponin and tannin, which have to be removed first. The manga sample ends at this point. I like the fact that we had a very different plot this time. I was getting a bit fed up with the uh, boy wants to hunt but he's too young, so he has to learn that hunting is a serious thing premise. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the first time we have such a big emphasis on the ritualistic side of the Jomon people. Although in most manga we don't get to the Jomon part of the story, the preview pages only cover the Paleolithic. But anyway, it was different and I like that. The next manga is entitled Jinbutsu Nio no Hekichi, which means the people and history of Japan. The characters are an elementary school boy named Yamamoto Takeru, who lives in Azai, a mysterious girl who can travel through time, Imenu Aya, Takeru's parents, Aya's grandfather, who is a historian, Takeru's teacher, Yodoki Miku, and his classmates, Shibata Mazaru and Akeshi Ikaru. The story begins in a suburb of the small town of Azai. Takeru is returning home, looking despondent. When he arrives, his mother welcomes him enthusiastically and invites him to have padding together. At the table, his mother notices that something is wrong with Takeru. The boy explains that he got a bad mark on an X3 exam. His mother comforts him by telling him that as long as the grade isn't too bad, it's fine, but her attitude changes completely as soon as she lays eyes on the exam paper. We never find out what grade Takeru actually got. Takeru goes upstairs to his room and comments to himself that history is boring, when a girl's voice contradicts him. The gu this girl, who appeared out of nowhere, enters Takeru's room through the window and begins to explain that the pet we are on 
is due to all those who came before us and that is necessary to know history in order to continue moving forward into the future. She immediately invites him to take a trip back in time together and Takeri responds with Who are you and how do you know my name? The girl responds by jumping out of the window and landing on the garden floor and reveals that her name is Aya. She knows Takeru's name because she heard his mother yelling at him earlier. Night falls and Aya is invited to dinner. Takeru's parents react as parents usually do when their son brings home a girl. Takeru's mother has made an Italian dish, osobuku, which consists of slices of veal with a bone in the middle. It's a traditional dish from the Lombardy region. Who would have thought that by reading a manga about the prehistory of Japan, I would be learning about Italian gastronomy. I'm not complaining, though. I just think it's really random. Well, it turns out that, it turns out that Aya, the mysterious girl, is actually a new neighbor. She lives alone with her grandfather, Imeno Sakuji, who is a historian currently studying an archaeological site dating back to the Paleolithic era. After the meal, Aya guides Takeru to his room, but when the boy enters, he finds himself walking across a starry sky. Aya reminds him that she can travel through time. After a moment's thought, she transports herself and Takeru to the Japan of 20,000 years ago. Takeru and Aya appear right in front of an almond's elephant and are forced to jump aside to dodge its onslaught. The elephant falls down a cliff and dies. A group of Paleolithic people witness the defeat and are amazed that two children manage to defeat an elephant off on their own. Thanks to this, they think that Takeru and Aya are gods. The two of them watch as the Paleolithic people cook and cut the meat. An old man then comes to offer them meat and this is where the story ends. This manga is interesting because it's the second one in which people from the current modern era travel back in time to the Paleolithic Japan. This time for real, not through virtual reality. And there was even interaction between these children of the current era and the Paleolithic people, which was something that I wanted, it, that I wanted to happen in one of these manga. And it makes sense that the primitives deify the children when they saw them come out of thin air and defeat an elephant. Now, moving on to the next one. This next manga that we are going to see, a book explaining Japanese history, is the most mature of them all. In fact, I doubt that this one in particular is for children. I think it's for adults. I immediately felt the vibe change when I saw that there were no drawings on the first few pages. No little figures in the table of contents or in the explanatory notes, nothing. And then the story began and the first thing I noticed was that most of the kanji didn't have furigana attached to them. So they assumed that the person reading this is already proficient and knows all the kanji of regular use, to around 2,500 kanji that the Japanese use on a daily basis. How long did I spend mulling over this manga? Long enough to deserve a strong cup of black tea. So excuse me while well, I go grab one. This manga deals with the early history of Japan in a completely different way from the others. It begins by telling a legend, the legend of Shufu, or Jofuku, as he is known in Japan. I wasn't expecting the opportunity to talk about this to fall in my lap like this, but I'm going to take it. And it's a good thing because we have just finished studying the Jomon period and we have barely started the Yayoi. Shufu, or Jofuku, was born in 255 BC and served in the Chinese court of the Xin dynasty as a court sorcerer and Taoist priest. One of his areas of expertise was alchemy. At that time, China was ruled by Xin Shi Wang, who was responsible for unifying the seven warring states under the Qin Empire. He was also the inventor of the title Wang Di, which we can translate as emperor. Before him, rules were called Wang, a title that is closer to the term king. Xin Shi Wang was therefore the first Wang Di, emperor of China. 
In Chinese mythology, there is a land where immortals live, called Mount Panglai, which is known in Japan as Ourai. The Emperor feared that and was therefore looking for a way to live forever, so he ordered Jofuku to find this legendary land and bring back the elixir of immortality. This land was believed to exist on an island somewhere in the eastern seas. Jofuku set out on, on two journeys, which took place between 219 BC and 210 BC. It is said that the sorcerer's fleet included 60 boats with soldiers, crew, craftsmen and 3,000 virgin boys and girls. The first expedition failed. Jofuku returned to China after a few years at sea and, when questioned by the Emperor, claimed that he had come across a giant sea creature that was blocking his way. The Emperor then added archers to Jofuku's fleet, so that the creature could be killed, and the ship set sail again in 210 BC. Jofuku never returned to China. A Chinese historical text, Shiji, reports that Sofo that Jofuku eventually arrived at a place with flat plains and wide marshes and made this land his domain. Other later texts also confirm the story, but the location of this land is never specified. Records of the Three Kingdoms, Book of the Later Han and Guadizi named the place Jofuku found Danzo, but again no one really knows where Danzo is. It, would, it wasn't until 1,100 years later that his idea emerged that Jofuku spent the rest of his days in Japan. A monk, Ishu, mentions in his writings that not only did Jofuku arrive in Japan, but he also named Mount Fuji Panlai, the legendary place where the elixir could be found. And indeed, Jofuku did find a plant with medicinal benefits, Lindera strychnifolia, Tendai Uyaku in Japanese. This plant belongs to the camphor family and grows naturally in the mountains of Kumano. Although it is no elixir of immortality, it is nevertheless widely used in traditional Asian medicine to treat stomach and kidney ailments, neuralgia, rheumatism and aging in general. Close enough, you could say, but the emperor probably wouldn't be satisfied with this weak substitute. Shofuku must have weighed all the pros and cons and decided it was best to stay in Japan. It is said that Jofuku brought in numerous agricultural techniques to the archipelago, introduced the cultivation of new plants and shared all kinds of knowledge with the natives. Numerous temples and memorials dedicated to Jofuku can be found all over Japan, so it's unclear where exactly he docked when he arrived from China. Many regions have legends relating to this man, but his tomb was built in Kumano. The site of Jofuku's grave has recently been designated as Jofuku Memorial Park, and every August there is a celebration in his memory. As for the fate of Emperor Shin Shiwang, a serious illness befell him during this fifth expedition to Eastern Sinem, and he died in a palace in Shakyu Prefecture in July or August 210 BC. He was 49 years old. There is a hypothesis that the cause of his death might have been related to taking an elixir containing mercury, an elixir that would have been prepared by court alchemists. So his search for eternal life might have ultimately resulted in his downfall. But as a, just as the story of Jofuku is a legend, I thought we know that it did exist because his birth is confirmed, so the tragic end of Shin Shi Wang might be nothing more than a myth. Now, this little story is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Emperor Shin Shi Wang, and I would have loved to talk more about him, but this is the part that connects with Japan's past, so I can't go on and on about the topics, because that would be Chinese history. And if I am to cover Chinese history one day, I want to do it right. Let's go back to the manga and see how they retell this legend. The story begins in the year 219 BC, Xin Dynasty, in Amyang, Shandong region. Jofuku is bowing before the emperor. The emperor gives him permission to speak, and Jofuku comments that the construction of the Shido is going splendidly. The Shi Road was built to allow the emperor to move around his territory, so it connected the capital to the provinces. And although I'm calling it a road, it should rather be understood as a network of roads, which expanded in all directions from capital Xi'an. The Xi Road was later expanded during the Han Dynasty. This road is considered one of the Xin Xi'an's greatest achievements, along with the beginning of the construction of the Great Wall and the building of Epang Palace. The Emperor changes the subject and asks how the quest for the legendary island to the east is going, allegedly the home of a divine being from whom Xin Shiwang wants to obtain the elixir of immortality. 
Joff Kupex for some more time and declares that he is making preparations for departure. On the journey ahead, 3000 virgin boys and girls will be joining him, an offering of purity. The Emperor concedes, but asks that he won't tolerate any more delays. I cannot die until I have built a thousand years of prosperity under the Qin Empire, he declares. Once he obtains the secret of eternal life, nothing will be able to stop him, and there will be nothing to fear. Jofku lives with a threat. If by any chance he has lied about the existence of the Elishir, the Emperor will not forgive him. As he walks through the corridors of the palace, Jofku reflects with trepidation on some of the acts committed by Shi Shi Wang. In the former era, before Xin Shi Wang stepped to power, there were many scholars and philosophies, which later came to be known collectively as the Hundred Schools of Thought. But Xin Shi Wang banned all philosophies except legalism, and proceeded to burn all books except those on the topics of astrology, agriculture, medicine, divination and the history of the Xin Empire. According to the historical text Shi Ji, already mentioned, he also had 460 scholars buried alive for the crime of possessing forbidden books, but recent studies suggest that this might be a myth. Jovku's motivations became clear. He wants to find an island outside the Emperor's domain and make it his new land, never to return. And so the fleet of ships set sail in 219 BC. The voyage begins calmly, with a favorable wind. But the storm soon hits the ships. Luckily, the rod waves end up guiding Jofoku to land. When he wakes up on the deck of his battered ship, he realizes that he is on the island he was looking for, which will later be known as Japan. Jofuku and the survivors explore the island, and the sorcerer is pleased to note that animals abound and the climate is humid. They soon come across the island's natives. The characterization of these natives is reminiscent of the Jomon period. In 219 BC, the archipelago was already at the beginning of the Yayoi era, but the manga justifies this apparent contradiction by explaining that Jofuku and his entourage landed in a region that had not yet been touched by Korean influences. Therefore, despite the advanced deer, the population would live as if they were in the Jomon era. The natives lead the newcomers to their village and offer them acorns. In return, Jofuku offers the natives rice. This is something that could have happened because in the historical text, biographies of Mount Engshang in Uweinan, it is said that Jofoku ships, in addition to the 3,000 boys and girls, also carried seeds of five types of grain, among them probably rice, and 1,000 horses. Jofoku teaches the tribe how to plant rice, and from the roots of the reeds he obtains iron, which he uses to show everyone how to make tools. Iron tools were originally made to help with agricultural activities and for other practical purposes, but over time weapons such as swords also began to be created. After some time in the village, Jofuku becomes a highly respected leader, and he finds himself very happy with the peaceful life he leads on the island, very different from the one he led at a time when he belonged to the Emperor's court, where he had to fight for power and always be on his guard reflects on those times as if they were a distant nightmare. Many, many years go by, and the village undergoes a complete transformation. We are now in a Yayoi setting, characterized by the landscapes marked by rice fields and the multiple buildings used to store the rice. Jovku and those who brought these innovations to the archipelago are remembered and venerated, but the peaceful and egalitarian environment that brought so much peace to Jofoku no longer exists. This new story begins when a servant runs to inform the village chief that a neighboring village is preparing to attack them, with the intention of stealing their rice. After an encouraging and bellicose speech from the chief, the villagers take up arms and prepare for war. The village whose story we have been following defeats the other and the chief lost in glee as he wields a bloody sword in the middle of the field full of fallen bodies. As of today, the neighboring village is ours too, he declares. And this is the story of how the war began. And also the moment when our sample ends. I don't think I need to say that this was the manga that I enjoyed the most, not only because the story is radically different from the others, but also because of the more mature approach. It's a shame that I had trouble deciphering some of the dialogues. By the way, if you notice and if you noticed any mistake, feel free to correct me in the comments, and I apologize in advance if I misread anything.
The latest educational manga that I've come across is from Kodanshin, a major Japanese publisher of literature and manga, and is simply called Japanese History. This manga has a special feature, however. It has a free version, which contains a selection of several stories, including the first, set in the Paleolithic period. There are 120 stories in total, spread over 20 volumes, and this free version gives you access to 10 stories, taken from different volumes to give you an idea of what a story of what a series contains as a whole. Of these, only the first story is relevant to us for now, because the second jumps right into the Aeon period, and it will take us a while to get there. This manga also includes the character introduction sheet taken from the first volume, and something that immediately caught my eye is that the characters are all linked by an object, a spearhead made of obsidian which travels through the hands of many and is passed down from generation to generation, from the Paleolithic to the Coffin period. And looking at these two pages, we can see the journey that the stone has made, represented by the dashed line. I don't know if this is something that ends in the Coffin period or if it continues, because I only have access to this sheet, but it would be nice if I but it would be nice if it continued to the end. The obsidian tip could be transformed into other objects, like a necklace or something, and continue to travel from end to end. It would become a common motif between all the stories, uniting the various volumes. I'm here running my mouth, but maybe that's exactly what happens. I would have to read the stories to know. Let's take a look at the characters who represent Paleolithic. We have Ajimi, a boy. This is the second time we have had a protagonist with his name. His mother Kai and his father's son, and Ajime's father and Ajime's father's older brother, his uncle Aratam. The story begins with a word, cold, perfect for describing the Paleolithic era. The characters in the story have been caught in a great storm and are sheltering in a cave. Ajime complains that he can't sleep because of the cold, which makes his father add more wood to the fire. His father then comments that the wind has stopped howling, which could mean that the storm has stopped. Thanks to the light coming through a crack in the cave, the family realizes that it's down, and as they leave the cave, they are greeted by a stunning mountain landscape decorated with snow. We also learn that the family is in a place they had never been before, and that they came to find this place because they were chasing prey. Ajimi is very excited at the prospect of being the first human to set foot on the land. Ajimi's father, naturally, is more cautious. The family set off in search of the herd of elephants they had been saging, taking care to remember the location of the cave where they had taken shelter. They realize they are heading in the right direction because a tree has been scrapped. The family stops to rest and have a bite to eat. The meal consists mainly of nuts and berries that can be found all around. When night is about to fall, the family builds a tent and lights a fire. While one stands guard, the others sleep. Ajime dreams that he is in the center of a pile of food and enjoys the feast. The next day, the family spots a camp in the distance, a group of Paleolithic people larger than theirs, and Sun and his brother deduce that his group is also after the same prey as them. Sun is torn, he doesn't know whether to stay and persist in the quest, or give up and go back to where they came from, the rain that is not unfamiliar to them. But the family's ramblings are interrupted by a herd of elephants that crosses their path. Sun realizes with surprise that these elephants are not the ones they were chasing, that they are bigger and more robust. They are now man's elephants, and when the two brothers try to hunt one down, they realize that the spears are unable to penetrate the skin of these animals. The herd resumes its march, and one of the elephants gives them a disdainful look. Sun and Arata feel defeated, and think they have no choice but to return to, them, to their homeland, but Ajime suggests that they join forces with the other Paleolithic people. Still, there is the problem of a lack of suitable weapons. Conveniently, when they look up, the family spots a deposit of obsidian, and Arata rejoices because he knows the value of obsidian, and also knows that with it, they can create weapons with the power to defeat an human elephant. Sen and Arata show the members of the other group how sharp the obsidian stone is, and motivate them to join them, because unity and wisdom are capable of overcoming the animal's strength and grandeur. Honestly, I think that in, that in this part of the story, it would make more sense for the elements of the other Paleolithic group to teach Ajime's family about obsidian 
and how to hunt Naumann's elephants, instead of the opposite. It would make much more sense because Ajimi's family are the newcomers. They didn't even know what a Naumann elephant was when they came across one. They had never seen an elephant of that size. But suddenly obsidian appears and somehow they know that this obsidian will be able to cut the skin of an animal they have never seen before. Mm, I don't know, I didn't like it. It seems like a classic example of overestimating the protagonists just because they are the protagonists and so they have to be more important than the other characters. But moving on. The Paleolithic people follow the herd of elephants to a lake and stand watch, positioned against the wind so that the animals don't sense their presence. Finally, one of the elephants wanders away from the herd and the group of humans seizes it. The elephant tries to escape, but gets stuck in the mud, along with the baby elephant. I don't know if the elephant getting stuck in the mud was part of the plan or if it was again a stroke of luck, but one way or another, it was thanks to this that the hunt was successful. The story ends, like most we have seen, with the characters feasting on meat after a long period of deprivation. Ajime thinks about the future with excitement and wonders what adventures he and his new friends will have in this new land that is now his. And these were the 10 educational manga I found whose setting is Japan during the prehistoric era. I'll put them on the screen in order from the one that I like the most to the one that I like the least. I hope that these last two videos have made the ideas that I tried to convey in my videos about the Paleolithic and the Jomon era clearer to you, or that you found it interesting to get to know these manga that are barely known here in the West, not to say that they aren't known at all. If a particular manga caught your eye, please tell us in the comments why. Now I could stop here and say that I have accomplished the challenge, but I have mentioned that there are some non-educational manga that also take place in the prehistory. Not many, it's true, it's not the preferred era of the mangaka. Samurais, ninjas, the second world war, that's what's odd, you know. But there are some manga that are set in the stone age nevertheless. And I, wanted, and I wanted to mention those manga, so I'm going to make a third and final video. And like educational manga, which have to maintain some level of accuracy and to contain somewhat formal-like parts, the manga that are intended only to entertain are not bound by these conventions. And that results in the most outlandish plots, with monsters, sacrifices, and even crazier stuff. Uh, in other words, a lot of fun. You will see what I mean if you watch the next video. I hope to see you there, and take care.